Hello YouTube. I'd like to take a look at the philosophy of colour. We're going to start off today by uh, talking about some basic colour science. Um, as with many philosophical topics, my view is that you simply can't deal with uh, the, the philosophical problem of colour adequately if you don't have some understanding of the, the relevant science. So that's where we will start. Okay, colour perception, as I'm sure you know, begins with light. Uh, the eye responds to a, a rather narrow band of electromagnetic radiation between uh, about 400 to 700 nanometers of the spectrum, and this is designated visible light. Uh, this is a, a nice image that I found online. Uh, so here is a light wave. Um, the important properties for our purposes are wavelength and amplitude. Um, Wavelength is uh, the distance between successive peaks or troughs. Similarly, we, we talk about frequency, which is the number of waves per second. Higher frequency, more waves per second, means shorter wavelength. I mean, there'd the, the be a shorter distance between successive peaks or troughs. Uh, and amplitude, uh, difference between a peak and a trough. Shorter wavelengths carry greater energy, as do higher amplitudes. Now, uh, putting things very simplistically, we might say that wavelength determines the colour of the light, uh, as, as you can see on the spectrum, whereas amplitude determines the, uh, uh, the, the brightness or intensity of the light. So another thing to uh, note about our visible spectrum, uh, you might notice that not all the colours are represented here. There are many extra spectral colours. The obvious ones are grayscale colours, so uh, white, grey, black. Uh, pink, magenta and lilac also don't appear. Brown uh, is standardly considered a colour in its own right, although it might be more of a dark orange, technically. Uh, so when we hear people say colours are wavelengths of light, we, we kind of have to be careful with that, because if we take that literally, we end up ignoring all kinds of colours. OK. So the basic processes of light are emission, absorption, reflection and transmission. The emission of light is, of course, the production of light, um, you know, the, the, the basic light source, so the sun, incandescent lamps, lightning, torches, TV screens and so on. The other three concern how light interacts with different mediums. Absorption occurs when light energy is transferred to uh, a surface, to the object. So uh, on, on a physical level, the energy of the photon is transferred uh, usually to the electrons of an atom. Um, and this is important because uh, electrons in atoms and in molecules tend to vibrate, and they vibrate at very specific frequencies. Now, when a light wave of a particular frequency interacts with electrons that vibrate at that same frequency, those electrons will absorb that light and it will be converted into a different form of energy, in this case, vibrational energy. So uh, different physical structures will absorb different wavelengths of light. You know, absorption depends on the, the vibrational frequencies of the electrons. Reflection, uh, that's of course when light bounces off an object. Transmission is when the light travels through the object or through the medium. And again, different wavelengths can be reflected or transmitted. Now, although these are the basic processes, objects interact with light in a variety of different ways. So, so colour arises from a, a huge variety of processes. Here's just a sample of the, uh, the, the light sources. Uh, incandescence, arc discharge, glow discharge, bioluminescence, sonoluminescence. Very interesting. This is where we can use, uh, basically, you have a liquid and you use um, sound waves to create a bubble in that liquid. Then you change the sound waves and that induces the bubbles to implode and they give off a flash of light. Um, so that's not something you see very often, but you can induce light uh, using sort of sound interacting with liquid. Um, here are a few ways colour can arise through uh, the interaction of light with objects. Um, C.L. Hardin, in the book Colour for Philosophers, has a rather nice discussion of a few examples involving blue. So um, let's take a look at them. Let's take a look at some, some ways that we can produce blue. The blue colour of the sky is caused by the scattering of light. Uh, under normal circumstances, under a cloudless sky, the gas molecules in the atmosphere preferentially scatter short wavelength light, which we see as blue. Uh, during sunsets, the light 
has to pass through more of the atmosphere since it's coming in uh, at, at an angle and the, uh, the, the, the shorter wavelengths are simply scattered away which leaves a, a yellowish hue. So that's why we have a blue sky in, in the day and then as the sun is setting the sky will, will sort of get a, a yellower sort of hue. The blueness of water has two sources. First of all, uh, water simply reflects the blue of the sky. Um, second, the vibrational transitions of the molecules of water, um, so that's where molecules gain vibrational energy, that these occur more readily at lower energies. So that's the longer wavelength, that's the redder part of the spectrum. So water absorbs mostly longer wavelength light. Uh, actually, it absorbs mostly in the infrared, um, uh, but, but uh, the, the long wavelength light, visible light is only weakly absorbed, but obviously we don't see infrared. Um, the, the, the shorter wavelength light, which appears bluer, is hardly absorbed at all. So, so of the visible spectrum, more of the longer wavelength light is absorbed. Um, so so that, that dominates and the water appears, appears blue, because the short wavelength bluer light is, is not absorbed. It's uh, reflected or transmitted. Um, the blue of a rainbow is caused by dispersion. Rainbows require uh, sunlight and water droplets. Essentially, sunlight enters the water droplet and then is reflected off the back of the, uh, the inner side of the droplet. Um, light travels at different speeds in different mediums. In particular, it travels slower in water than in air. So when light enters a water droplet, it's refracted. Uh, it bends a little. Shorter wavelengths bend slightly more than longer wavelengths. Uh, the light is bent again when it's re re reflected back out of the rainbow, uh, back out of the water droplet. So uh, the white light of the sun is dispersed into the colours of the spectrum. Consider iridescent colours that you can see on the bodies of some beetles. The main cause of this is that beetle shells have a series of very fine plates or ridges which are oriented in different directions. And the result of this structure is that at particular angles, some wavelengths of light interfere in phase and are intensified, while other wavelengths interfere out of phase and are cancelled. Uh, and of course, the colour you see is dependent on the angle of viewing. At, at different angles, um, longer wavelengths uh, might be intensified. So that's the iridescent effect. Beetles also have a layer of pigment below the plates that enhances the, the colours. Most blue coloration in animals is caused by scattering, just like the colour of the sky. Blue eyes result from scattering by the turbid medium in the iris. There is no blue pigment in the iris. Uh, in all eyes, pigment is brownish or black. Then there's uh, the blue caused by bioluminescence, uh, which is when organisms emit light as a result of chemical reactions involving the pigment luciferin. So, uh, those are just a few examples of how we can produce blue, a few examples of the causes of blue. Now the point here is that the same colour can have a very striking variety of physical causes. And the converse is also true. Different colours have can, can have very similar physical causes. Emeralds are green and rubies are red. But the chemical compositions and the crystal structures of emeralds and rubies are very similar. In fact, the green of emeralds and the red of rubies are both caused by the same impurity. It's caused by aluminium ions being replaced with chromium ions. So chromium uh, produces green in emerald and it produces red in rubies. The different colours arise because in emeralds the crystal field strength is slightly weaker. The, the, the host molecules interact with the chromium more weakly and that produces different, different colours, um, different colour from rubies. Um, so, uh, also note that some experiences of colour don't involve any perceptual input from the external world, or, or at least they involve perceptual input in a kind of deviant fashion. So there are dreams and hallucinations, um, perhaps caused by drugs. There are uh, deviances of the visual system, um, illusions, afterimages, the McCulloch effect. Uh, we can induce experiences of colour by direct electrical stimulation of relevant parts of the brain. There are various types of synesthesia in which experiences of colour can be caused by uh, other sensory inputs. For instance, people report seeing colours when they hear noises. It's a fascinating condition. If you're not familiar with synesthesia, uh, look it up. It's really interesting. So 
uh, so the, the, the point here is simply that when we look at what actually causes colour, um, we can have the same colour, say a blue, can be caused by many, many different kinds of, of physical causes. And the two different colours may be caused by similar physical causes. So we need to bear that in mind when we when we think when we turn to the philosophy of colour. This is a very important important point to to keep in mind here. And of course, there can be many colour uh, experiences that aren't connected to anything going on in the external world. Right. So let's take a look at the physiology of colour perception. Here is an eye. Light is focused by the cornea and the lens. Uh, and it hits the retina at the back of the eye here. The uh, fovea is very important. Um, this is a small part of the retina that provides our high acuity vision. Photoreceptors are packed very, very tightly in, in the fo fovea, it, um, and it's also thinner than the rest of the retina to allow the best passage of light through. Uh, we don't really need to worry about the rest of the eye. Um, let's take a look at the retina. This is a diagram of the retina. The basic structure of the retina is that we have different types of cells organized in layers. So at the bottom are photoreceptors, which respond to light. These connect to bipolar cells. The bipolar cells connect to ganglion cells. Uh, and the ganglion cells project an axon down the optic nerve. Ganglion cells are the only cells that send information out of the retina. We also have um, what are called horizontal cells and amacrine cells. Um, and, and these serve to modify the responses of bipolar and ganglion cells. But don't worry too much about them. The, the, the point, the, the basic structure is we have photoreceptors connecting to bipolar cells, connecting to ganglion cells. Now, the only cells that are directly sensitive to light are the photoreceptors. Um, and these are at the bottom. So interestingly, the retina is actually inside out. Light has to, has to come in and travel through all of these other cells before hitting the photoreceptors. Um, this doesn't cause too many problems because the cells are transparent. So uh, although, uh, um, although there's all this stuff in front of the photoreceptors, it's, it's transparent so light goes through pretty quickly. But there are a couple of exceptions to this. Um, first of all, the, the ganglion cells have to connect back to the brain. Um, where the axons of the ganglion cells leave the eye, there are no photoreceptors and that causes the blind spot. There are also blood vessels over the surface of the retina, um, which supposedly can be revealed if you sort of stand in a dark room and jiggle a torch over your eyes or something. I'm, I'm not sure. If you shine a torch into your eyes at an angle and then jiggle it, you can apparently see uh, shadows of the blood vessels. Although I, I've tried that, it, it never worked for me. So I, I don't know. Uh, okay, photoreceptors. There are two types of photoreceptors rods and cones. Uh, you can see them here. It's a diagram of of their close-up structure. So here's a rod and here's a cone. Uh, the main difference is in the outer segment. Uh, again, it's kindly oddly named because these outer segments are actually further in. They're, they, they're, they're at the very bottom of the retina with the bipolar cells connecting at the synaptic terminals. Uh, but they're called outer segments. The, the outer segments contain stacks of discs that contain light-sensitive pigment, photopigment. Um, unsurprisingly, given the larger number of discs, rods are far more sensitive to light than cones. Rods are saturated during daylight and are active during nighttime vision when there's, there's not enough light for the cones. But rods are monochromatic. They can't perceive colour. Uh, and this is because all rods contain the same kind of photopigment. So there's, there's, there's no way for rods to, to track uh, differences in colour. So we'll mainly be focusing on the cones. The cones, cones are the cells that, that really do the work of colour vision. Now, an important element of our understanding of colour vision is the trichromatic theory, which was developed in the 1800s by Thomas Young and Hermann von Helmholtz. Young and Helmholtz noticed that all the colours that we see can be produced by just three types of monochromatic light, red, blue and green. Uh, this is what TV and computer screens use, the, the pixels uh, are, are, are red or blue or green and they produce the full range of colours using various combinations of those. Uh, every colour of the rainbow can be matched 
using uh, combinations of red, blue and green light. Uh, if you mix blue and red light, you get purple light. If you mix red and green light, you get yellow light. Um, so we have, for instance, two types of yellow. There's pure spectral yellow, which has just one wavelength. And then there's the yellow that results from mixing red and green. Uh, now, the crucial point is that provided you get the mixture just right, you won't be able to distinguish a pure spectral yellow from a composite yellow. This is an example of a phenomenon known as metamerism, where two very different illuminants appear indistinguishable. Similarly, there are reflective metamers, objects that reflect different wavelengths of light, but are indistinguishable. Uh, so, on the basis of, uh, of, of this fact that various combinations of only three types of light are sufficient to match any colour, Young and Helmholtz predicted that the retina contains three cone types, Different patterns of stimulation of these three cone types produces the uh, many varied colours that we see. <clears throat> this prediction is correct. The cone photoreceptors each contain one of three different types of photopigment. Uh, and the three different types of photopigment are sensitive to different wavelengths of light. Uh, so uh, there are three types of cone in the retina. We have uh, short wavelength cones or S cones these are maximally responsive to about 430 nanometer light. Medium wavelength cones, M cones, uh, which are maximally responsive to about 530 nanometer light. And long wavelength cones, L cones, maximally responsive to about 560 nanometer light. Uh, colloquially, these are sometimes called the uh, blue, green and red cones respectively. Shorter wavelength light is bluer, longer wavelength light is redder. Although, as we will see, this this is a bit of a misnomer. You should be very careful calling them you know, blue, green and red cones. Um, here is a graph showing the spectral sensitivities of the three cone photopigments. And the wavelength that, uh, we can see the wavelength that maximally activates them at the top here. This blue line represents the S cones, the green line is the M cones, and the red line the L cones. This black line shows the uh, sensitivities of the rods, although as noted, rods don't really play a role in colour, so ignore that line. Uh, now you can see that the uh, sensitivities of the medium and long wavelength cones overlaps substantially more than that of the uh, medium and short wavelength cones. Uh, also note that if you compare this, these uh, sensitivities with the spectrum, which is shown below here, the peak sensitivities are not at blue, green and red. They're rather at sort of violet uh, at, at green, the green is at green, uh, but the long wavelength is, is actually at yellow, uh, the peak sensitivity. So obviously that's a sign that you know, there's, there's, there's a lot more processing involved um, in, in the brain and in, in the visual system than just the responses of, of these, of these uh, cones. Um, as I said, although people sometimes call them blue, green and red cones, we really need to take that with a grain of salt. The red cones are maximally sensitive to um, actually a kind of greenish yellow light. Okay, the colour that we perceive is based on the pattern of activity of all the cones. Now the crucial point here is that individual cones are colour blind. And this results from what's called the principle of univariance. A photon of light is a, a, a photon of light absorbed by a cone has the same effect on the cone no matter what the wavelength of the light is. Cones respond only to the number of photons absorbed. So a cone will signal uh, more either when the wavelength moves towards moves towards the cone's peak sensitivity or when the intensity of the light increases. Very weak light, whose wavelength is at the cone's peak sensitivity, will mean that there are few photons uh, being produced, but a large fraction of those photons get absorbed. On the other hand, very bright light, at a, at a low sensitivity point, will mean that there are many photons around, but few of them get absorbed. So the cone will produce the same response in each case. I mean, let's, let's uh, take, a, take a specific example, right? Let's look at the L cone. We can see that light of about 650 nanometers 
and light of about 490 nanometers will produce the same response in the cone. Uh, or if we take light of about 490 nanometers and about 620 nanometers, but then increase the intensity of the 490 nanometer light, they will produce the same response. If we had, say, you know, three times more uh, uh, 400 nanometer light, that will equal the 620 nanometer light. So intense blue light will produce the same response as dim red light. Now suppose we add a second cone type with different sensitivity. In this case, a given light will excite the cones differently. And we can now compare the responses of the two types of cone. And this, uh, this is what allows us to distinguish wavelength from intensity. So if we take the 620 nanometer light again, we can see that this produces a very different response in the, the M cones and the L cones. The L cones are about three times as sensitive, more than three times as sensitive. 490 nanometer light also produces a different response in each cone. Here, the M cones are slightly more sensitive than the L cones. These differences in response will be preserved no matter what the intensity of the light is. So the, the visual system can use these differences in response to distinguish wavelength from intensity. So you know, if, if we imagine increasing the intensity of the 490 nanometer light, well, th that will mean that uh, the response of the uh, L cones is stronger, but similarly, the response of the M cones will, will also be, be stronger. So the, the relative differences are preserved even after increasing intensity, and that's what allows the visual system to distinguish wavelength from intensity. <clears throat> so uh, the human eye has, as I say, three cones. Most animals have a different system. Many mammals, for instance, dogs and elephants, are dichromatic. They have only two types of photopigment, which renders them effectively red-green colorblind. This is the color spectrum that a dog will probably see. As, as, as you can see, it's very impoverished uh, relative to ours. They, they can basically only see um, a, a kind of yellow to blue uh, spectrum. Many marine mammals have only one type of photopigment that renders them monochromatic. They, they can't distinguish colors at all. Um, and of course, the, the same points are true for some humans. Different forms of color blindness are caused by uh, either lacking one or more of the three photopigments or by having an anomalous form uh, of, of one of the three photopigments. More interestingly, there are animals with superior color discrimination. Uh, mammals in general actually have comparatively poor uh, color vision. Uh, in fact, we've got poor vision in general, uh, and that's a result of our ancestors living in caves where, uh, where good eyesight was less useful. If we look at birds, uh, birds tend to have better eyes than us and they can see more colours. Hawks are tetrachromats, they have four photopigments, um, with one in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Uh, there's evidence that pigeons are pentachromats, they have five photopigments. Mantis shrimps supposedly have 12 types, um, so they potentially see colours beyond anything we can imagine. Um, 12 types of photopigment. It's, uh, Yes, it's, it's inconceivable. Um, it'd be very interesting to know how the world looks to a mantis shrimp. The trichromatic theory explains a lot about colour vision, uh, but the physiologist uh, Yuval Herring noticed in the 1890s that there are many phenomena that are still quite puzzling. First of all, after images. You're all familiar with these. If you stare at this image for 20 seconds or so and then um, look away or close your eyes, you will continue to see the image with the colours reversed. So uh, pause the video here and try it if you want. Um, you know, so you might have done that and you'll have noticed that you will have seen an, an after image. Why does this happen? Uh, second, some colour combinations are impossible. We can mix blue and red to get purple, but you can't generate a new colour out of blue and yellow. If you mix uh, blue and yellow light, you just get, you get white. Uh, similarly, there's no uh, there's no red green. Um, of course, uh, as we noted earlier, if you mix red and green light, you get yellow. <clears throat> but yellow isn't a reddish green. Um, you know, it's 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 sort of its own colour. You you don't sort of see it as a mixture of red and green in the same way that you can sort of see purple as a mixture of blue and red. Third, some colours are unique hues. If you examine 
various different hues of red. Some of them look more orangey, some of them look yellowish, some look more purpley or bluish. But there is a red that looks just pure red. It has no yellowish or bluish component. Uh, same, with, uh, same with blue, right? Some blues look more greenish, uh, some look more reddish, but there's a blue that looks pure blue. And just blue, unique blue. On the other hand, some colours appear only as combinations of other colours. These are the binary hues. Orange always looks somewhat yellowish and somewhat reddish. Purple always looks somewhat reddish and somewhat bluish. So red, yellow, green and blue can all have unique hues. And all other colours seem to arise out of some combination of these. Um, or some combination of these with white and black. These considerations led Herring to develop the opponent process theory. The basic idea is that visual perception involves three channels, black, white, uh, or relative luminance, and then blue, yellow, uh, and red, green. The idea is that in each channel, a group of cells fires at a certain neutral base rate. A certain stimulus will either excite or inhibit them, for instance, in the red-green channel, uh, red light may excite the cells, while green light may inhibit them. In the yellow-blue channel, yellow may excite the cells, while blue inhibits them. Colour perception arises from the interaction between these channels. Um, so if both channels are excited, we see red and yellow, or orange, right? Because we, we've got the, the, the red input and the yellow input, and that produces, that produces the sensation of, or of orange. If the red-green channel is excited while the yellow-blue channel is inhibited, we see red and blue, or purple. If the red-green channel is completely neutral while the yellow-blue channel is inhibited, we will see unique blue, a blue that's uh, neither reddish nor greenish, because the, the red-green channel is neutral, so there's no uh, red or green input, whereas the yellow-blue channel is inhibited, so we're just getting the unique blue. Uh, and this, of course, also explains why some colour combinations are impossible. You can never see a yellowish blue because this would require the same channel, the yellow blue channel, to be both excited and inhibited at the same time. Yellow light excites the cell, blue light inhibits it. So that, that just cancels the response and leaves white. Uh, and of course the, the black white channel um, plays a role in this as well in determining how bright the colour is. So this uh, seems to explain unique hues, and it also explains why the colour palette is limited in the way it is. What about after images? Well, the idea is that cells can be fatigued. When a cell receives the same stimulus for a long period of time, it adapts and returns to its neutral base rate. So when we look at a red square, this uh, relative increase in uh, longer wavelength light excites the red-green opponent channel. But as we stare at it, the cells are fatigued and they gradually drop back down to their neutral firing rate. So what happens when we look away? Well, let's say we uh, turn away and stare at a white wall. The relative amount of short and medium wavelength light reflected by the wall is higher than the amount from the red square. The, the, the proportion of short and medium, medium wavelength light entering our eyes has increased. So that will inhibit the red-green opponent cells, producing the green after image. Here's a diagram. Right, Red-green opponent cells are firing at a neutral base rate. You look at the red circle, the cells are excited. As you stare at the circle, they become fatigued and drop back down to the neutral, the neutral rate. When you look away, or when the, the, the stimulus is turned off, um, the, the, the relative proportion of shorter and medium wavelength light increases, because this is white light, so there's a lower proportion of long wavelength light coming from a white surface than there is from a red surface, so this inhibits the cells. This then produces the sensation of green, because the cells are now inhibited. The opponent process theory was initially in competition with the trichromatic theory, but the current consensus is that they're both correct. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, Leo Hervich and Dorothea Jameson combined the two theories into a two-stage model. Uh, we, we have uh, three types of photoreceptors, the uh, long wavelength, medium wavelength, and short wavelength. And these feed into the two types of colour opponent channel as shown in, in this diagram. So the L and M cones uh, feed the red-green channel, which calculates uh, the difference between the two cones. While for the yellow-blue channel, 
input from the L and M cones is summed to make yellow. Then the channel computes the difference between the, the S cones uh, and this sum of the uh, L and M cones. So the yellow-blue channel involves all three cones. Uh, the black-white channel uh, isn't shown here, but that uses the L and M cones. Uh, the end result is four opponent colours, but only three types of cone. In a famous study in, um, the, uh, 19, in the 1950s, Hervich and Jameson developed experimental tests to measure the opponent functions uh, more precisely, and this allows us to represent the opponent channels as a graph like this. So uh, here we have the yellow-blue channel, uh, and here the red-green channel. Uh, don't worry about this grey line. We can see where the hue, where the unique hues will be. This dotted line shows uh, where we find unique yellow, because uh, here the red green channel is neutral, giving us whereas the uh, yellow blue channel is excited. So we have a, a yellow that is uh, neither greenish nor reddish. There's no uh, red or green input at all, but the yellow blue channel uh, is excited, producing the experience of unique yellow. Uh, and you can see that as the wavelength in increases, the uh, the response of the yellow-blue channel declines, whereas we get an increasing response from the uh, red-green channel. So that will be increasingly reddish or orangish, um, eventually going into red. Uh, at about um, maybe 492 nanometers just here, uh, we see that the red-green channel is inhibited producing the experience of green, while the yellow-blue channel is completely neutral, so that will be a unique green. So, um, so those, are the, uh, those are the functions of the, the opponent channels. Now, although I've been talking about cells being inhibited and excited and opponent channels and so on, uh, take it with a bit of a grain of salt because we're still not really sure how the opponent process mechanism is physically realised in the brain. These results are based on uh, psychological experiments. Um, but there's, there's still a lot of um, debate about how exactly colour perception works in, in the later stages of uh, visual processing. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot we don't know, and a lot of what I've said is somewhat simplified. Uh, but I can describe a little bit of the early stages of vision beyond the cones. As we saw earlier, the retina contains uh, photoreceptors, which connect to bipolar cells, which connect to ganglion cells. With, uh, with the horizontal and amacrine cells uh, also influencing the output. Now, ganglion cells are the cells that send information out of the retina. So I'll say a little about these. A ganglion cell receives input from uh, several cones, and the group of cones that connects to a ganglion cell is called the receptive field of that ganglion cell. In the fovea, we have one cone for one ganglion cell, so its receptive field is, is one cell, which provides very fine detail. As I mentioned, the fovea is the part of the retina that produces very high acuity vision. It's basically the, the centre of vision. Um, now, receptive fields are organised into centre and surround. Um, ganglion cells appear to uh, represent the first separation into the red, green and yellow, blue channels. We have uh, red-green ganglion cells and yellow-blue ganglion cells. So let's consider a red-green ganglion cell. Hitting the center with red may excite the cell. This is called a red-on center. Uh, on uh, center. Uh, oh, that's, that's, that's wrong there. Uh, ignore this, ignore this um, bit here. That should say red-on center, green off surround. Sorry about that. Uh, got that wrong there. Uh, so, so anyway, um, hitting the uh, center with red produces uh, an, an excited, excitatory response, so that's a red on center. Hitting the surround with green um, inhibits the cell, so that's a green off surround. Other cells may have a green on center and a red off surround. So the point is that the response to one wavelength in the center of the cell will be cancelled by showing the opposite wavelength to the surround of the cell. Here's a diagram showing the different responses of a red on center uh, and green off surround ganglion cell. Under white light, cells fire at the base rate. So there's the, the, the firing rate just there. Similarly, when uh, red light hits the center and green hits the surround, the response is pretty much neutral um, since the cell will be excited by the red light at the center, but inhibited equally by the green light at the surround. 
When red light is shone just in the centre, as in case B, we can see that the cell is highly excited. When red light bathes the entire cell, the cell is excited, but not as much as when red is shone only in the centre. Uh, so th the reason for this is that uh, red light activates the M cones as well as the L cones. Remember, the response curves of the cones overlap. The M cones, which are associated with green light and so feed the off surround, are activated by red light. So if the so, so if the off surround part is hit by red light, that will tend to inhibit the cell. Um, here's, here's another uh, diagram to illustrate how this works. Suppose we have a ganglion cell being fed by L cones, shown in red, and M cones, shown in green. Now suppose that red light hits only the L cones, which feed the red on centre of this ganglion cell. Well, the cell will be very excited. But now suppose that, that the light also hits the M cones, and these feed the cells green off surround. Well, these M cones will respond somewhat to the red light. They won't respond uh, as strongly as much as the L cones do, but they will respond a little bit. So this will slightly inhibit the, the ganglion cell relative to this uh, first case. This might seem like a rather odd setup, but the benefit of this is that it permits superior edge detection. So here's a photo of a, a retina and uh, these circles represent the receptive fields of uh, ganglion cells, of three ganglion cells. Uh, the, the different colours don't mean anything. Uh, it's just so you can easily tell them apart. There's no uh, meaning to the, the yellow, blue and white. It's just so we can easily see you know, each, each circle. Uh, receptive fields overlap, as you can see. Different ganglion cells can uh, respond to the same photoreceptor, can receive input from the same photoreceptor. Now suppose that red light hits the receptive fields like this. Okay, so that's a patch of red light hitting those receptive fields. Let's diagram what's going on here. Um, okay, so uh, this, this is just representing the base rate of the cell. So this is the cell under white light. Okay, so now let's take the first case, number one. This cell is bathed entirely in red light. The whole receptive field is bathed in red light, which, as we've seen, excites the cell uh, somewhat. In, for number two, the second case, red light hits the centre fully, fully hits the centre, but hits only part of the surround. So the centre is, is equally stimulated in this case as in this case, but the surround is, is less stimulated. So the ganglion cell will be slightly more excited uh, in this second case than in the first case. What about the third case, number three? Well here, red light hits part of the surround, but it doesn't hit the centre at all. The, the, the M cones feeding the green off surround will be activated, uh, so that will inhibit the response of the cell. But there's nothing hitting the centre, there's, there's, there's nothing stimulating the cell. So this cell, this third case, will actually be slightly inhibited overall. So ultimately, uh, the cells, all the cells completely bathed in red light are excited. The cell on the edge of the red light, uh, where, where, where the centre is bathed, but the surround is only par partially bathed, that will be super excited. And then the, the cell next to that one uh, will be slightly inhibited. And you can see that this will have the effect of improving edge detection. For the cells at the edge of the red light, one will be super excited and another slightly inhibited. And so this produces a very sharp, uh, very sharp difference, basically. Very s sort of sudden, sharp difference, which um, just allows us to sort of immediately perceive the edges better. So that's, uh, that's a basic introduction there to ganglion cells. A final important part of colour perception that I want to note is colour constancy. Uh, this is where colours seem to remain the same under different kinds of illumination. Look at a white piece of paper in daylight and then look at it uh, in incandescent light. Daylight contains a uh, far higher proportion of short wavelength energy. So paper that's white under incandescent light, you would expect to look blue under daylight. But of course it looks white in both cases. Similarly, a lump of coal in sunlight reflects far more light than a, a piece of white paper under an indoor light. Um, but obviously the, the lump of coal looks much darker than the white piece of paper. So our visual system uh, tracks uh, relative differences in illumination rather than absolute illumination. 
One way uh, you can uh, see how significant the different kinds of illuminant can be is to wait until the sun is setting, turn on a light but leave the window open. Uh, make sure the sun is not visible from the window. Everything outside the window will kind of look strongly blue. But if you were to walk outside, you would see everything as having its usual colour. You might see a slight blue tint to, to everything for a, a, little, a little short while, but that, that will adapt out pretty quickly. In an interesting experiment by Edwin H. Land, two black and white slides of the same photo were shown through two projectors, with the projectors set up so that the projections overlapped exactly producing one image. One slide was taken with a red filter and projected through a red filter. The other was taken with a green filter and projected with white light. The resulting projection approximated the hues of the original scene, including the blues, but there were no, uh, there were no blue wavelengths, as it might be, present. Um, there were no, no wavelengths of that colour. So this experiment demonstrates uh, just how much processing goes on higher in the brain. It appears that we can see blue even where all the blue has been removed from the picture. Uh, Land describes this experiment in his article The Retinex Theory of Colour Vision. In another experiment discussed by Land, conducted by John McCann and Jean Benton, they had participants view a display that had just enough light to activate their rods. We mentioned before that rods are sensitive to far lower levels of light than cones are but rods can't see colour. So uh, at this point, the participants just see black and white. They then added a monochromatic illuminant near 700 nanometers, adjusted just enough so that it activated the long wavelength cones. But the short wavelength and medium wavelength cones were unresponsive. Despite this, the participants were able to see nearly the full range of colour. Somehow, uh, interaction between the rods and cones or, or visual processing in, in, in the brain is, is somehow able to make up for this massive loss of, of stimulus. So colour constancy can be the source of some pretty striking uh, illusions, which I will end with. Here's one of my favourites by Bo Lotto. Look at the centre pieces of these two objects, these centre cross pieces here. One is blue, and one is yellow, right? No, they're both the same shade of grey. Um, unbelievable, I know, um, but it, if you don't believe me, take a, a sort of print screen or, or whatever of this, uh, take a screen cap of this and um, you know, open it up in paint or whatever and have a look at them. They are both the same shade of grey. Similarly, look at these cubes. Okay, look at the four blue squares here and the seven yellow squares here on the right. Uh, again, we, uh, this, uh, this, the, the, they appear to be uh, very different colours. They are again the same shade of grey. Uh, take away the, the context and they both look exactly the same. These four blue squares here and the seven yellow squares here, they're exactly the same shade of grey. So somehow the visual system is able to understand that uh, uh, grey light from yellow illumination uh, must be caused by a blue surface, whereas grey light given blue illumination must be caused by a yellow surface. Um, so when we see these images we interpret these these four squares as blue and these seven squares as yellow. Here's uh, a painting by James Gurney. Uh, this appears to show the same cube in red light here and in green light here. Uh, this cyan square is exactly the same shade of grey as this red square both the same shade of grey. Uh, one more example again by James Gurney. The two labelled squares, one and two, are the same shade of grey. Okay, um, this video was intended as a very brief introduction to some elements of colour science and to some basic uh, concepts in colour perception. Um, there is far more involved in the physics of colour and in the physiology of colour perception than I discussed in this video and I, I have simplified things somewhat. Um, but hopefully what I've said here will give us enough of a background to start dealing with the philosophical problems which is what I'm most interested in, it's what this series is, is, will be about. Uh, so we'll start looking at that in the next video. Uh, but it was important to um, to get a bit of a background in, in some of the in some of what we the facts some of the empirical facts that we know about color perception so i hope you found that interesting and i'll see you in the next video goodbye